So, my name's Langford Parton, and I have an addiction. And it seems like everybody in here has the same addiction, honeybee. <laughs> and we have the same problems. Bees, I know there's probably a couple of gentlemen in here from the golden age when you put them in a box, you stuck them out back, you forgot about them, and went out in October, and you had supers upon supers of honey. I can tell that gentleman right there is one of them. We don't have that luxury anymore. Now, my first question to you guys, and this is an open question, when should you start winterizing your bees? Started a month ago. Anybody else? August. Depends on the weather. August. Depends on the weather. I say you start winterizing your bees a month before the summer solstice. Because that's when you reach your best planes. You're going to give them a brood break. And then after the summer solstice, the bees start cutting back on the amount of food that they give the queen, which she cuts back on the amount of laying she got, does during the dirt. There's a slight pickup in the fall, but then you go in the winter, and I know you've seen it, you're going out there and you've got, man, I've got a strong hive of bees, they're just loaded. And then all of a sudden you're like, where'd they go? And you open them up and you've got four or five frames of bees and that's it, in two weeks time. Your summer bees are dead. What you have left is your winter bees, and you're hoping that that cluster is going to be big enough to make it through winter. I've had a small five frame medium that I wrote off. I put a sugar shim on top of it and said, well, they'll be dead by spring. Checked on them in January. Well, they're still alive. I'll give them a little bit more sugar. Go out there in March, and there's five frames of bees, no food in the hive, and they're a day or two away from starving to death and you put this humongous hive to bed and it's dead by December. What's the common denominator? I think it's genetics. I breed planes, I sell planes, and I do some nukes. And right now, you do what you can't do during the spring and summer, you sell honey. So I think genetics plays a lot into it because you have the mite maulers, you have the ankle biters, you have this, you have that. I run a couple of lines of, of bees and I buy a couple of breeders, but I do a lot of swarm trap. And I'll go three to five miles away from any known managed bees, find bees, catch them, bring them to an out yard where I actually grade these bees, and if they grade out, I'll put them into the breeder program. But we got to think about in the winter solstice, the days start getting longer. That plane starts laying a little more, a little more, a little more. And in our neck, neck of the woods, when the red maples kick in, it's on. Well, same thing with the summer solstice. Once that day hits the peak length, and then it starts slowly getting shorter and shorter, those bees start cutting back. So that's my, my thought of when I start thinking about winterizing the bees. You can't go out there now and go, okay, I got to do something. You might be a little bit too late. Because number one thing you got to think of is you can't feed them now. We're going to be down into what, 30s tonight? Maybe 20s in some of the mountain locations? You can't really can't feed them liquid. If you do, you're running the risk of extra condensation in the hive. And I disagree with Studer. He thinks over the last couple of years it's trachea mice that's been killing our bees. I always think it's condensation. Because how many of you have walked out there in the middle of the winter and seen water running out of your, the front of your hive and it hadn't rained in a couple of days? I know I have. Condensation condenses, it drops down on the bees, they get chilled, they die. They, you always heard the thing, oh, well, my bees, they're all in one cluster and there's honey everywhere, but why did they die? They got to a point where they couldn't move, it got cold enough, and they couldn't move to honey. The way I overwinter bees, I have a two to two and a half inch shim that I put on the top of every one of my hives, put a piece of newspaper down for a five frame nuke. I'll mix four pounds of sugar, one pound of pollen sub. I use Ultra Bee from Man Lake. 
because Randy Oliver says that's the scientific beekeeper says that's the best pollen sun. I don't know if it is or not. I've tried that and mega ultra bee and mega bee. And my bees didn't like mega bee. They just wouldn't touch it. Put that on there. Put them. Put the lid back on them. Put a one inch blue board from uh, Lowe's under the lid. So that way, when that that heat does rise and hits that blue board, it doesn't condensate, or it doesn't form condensation drops and then drop back down on the bee. That sugar I do not use. Uh, David gave me Kent Williams's formula. I do not make wet sugar go on mine. I want it all to use the absorption factor to absorb that condensation. Over the last three years, I'm not going to press with. I've had a loss rate of 6, 12, and 12%. Some of it's my fault. <coughs> it, see, it works for me. Beekeeping is local. It may not work for you. What works for you may not work for me. But I put that on top of the hive. <coughs> I'll go back in in December and check it. And a lot of times I've found that the bees will ignore their honey and they will eat the sugar. And then, well, They've eaten half of it, three quarters of it, put another piece of newspaper down on a nice 55, 60 degree day, we always have them. Redo it, go back in in January, go back in in February. Okay. And in spring, you know, once February's hit, you really don't need to put any more on there. They can eat the honey they have stored in the bottom, and they're off to the races. Eight frames, I put eight pounds of two cups of pollen so. The commercial guys, though, this is, I believe in propolis. And I know some of you guys are like, man, that just stuff gets in my way, it's on my fingers, it's on my hive tool, it's in my back pocket. I, pro I personally believe in propolis. Propolis is the bee glue, it's antimicrobial, antibacterial, it's basically their medicine cabinet. Because they have nothing other than what we give them. That is, uh, so, yeah, and the commercial guys have kind of bred that out of the bees. You, know, they, you buy a package from down south and you get a little bit of propolis and you won't get much of anything. Sue Colby has the Caucasian line from the Republic of Georgia uh, that she's inseminated and they are massive propolis machines. I've gotten a baseball size off the top of just scraping the top of the frames off when I take the lid off when I can get the lid on. But those seem to be some of the healthiest bees because I can send a small cluster in the winter and they make it through. The other thing is you've got to get your queen excluders on. You can't have queen excluders and a honey super above. I had a gentleman ask me why his hive died. I said, okay, I'll come over and, and do a hive inspection with you. First thing you can see is the queen excluder band. Bees were up top, she was down bottom. I'm like, you got to get that queen excluder off there. Uh, I remove honey soup. If I have a powerful hive going into winter, I might leave it in one deep brew chamber and a honey soup. But I'd, I'd err with caution, and like Kent Williams, he'll take all of his down to a single brood chamber, put that sugar on top. He closes his up and forgets about it. Of course, when you've got five, six hundred hives and you've got a bunch down in Florida getting ready to go to the islands, you don't have time to go look at all that. I don't know how many hives you guys have, but a hundred and something keeps me kind of busy. Uh, You never remove the honey from the brood chamber. I personally, my hives face southeast, and when I go through and do my <coughs> inspection the first part of October, I'll write on, I'll do all my notes on top of the lid. That way I'm not trying to flip through a book. I can look up there and you guys would look at it and go, what's all that? Looks like chicken scratch, it's abbreviations. But I'll go through and do my inspections and I'll take them down to one brood chamber and it may read, 4B, 3H, 1E, four brood frames, full brood, three frames of honey, one empty. 
make they five. That way I know when I'm getting ready to put them, put the sugar on them like I've been doing the last week and a half, I know if, okay, if this one's a little weak, I can still frame a brood from the one that's got five. If this one's perfect, you know, take a nuke. If it's got three frames of brood and two frames of honey, I'll be quite perfect on the lid. Come back, all I do is just put the shim on it, put sugar on it, close it up, and forget about it. The thing is, in October, you're getting to where the temperatures, they say you're not supposed to feed liquid 50 or below because they can't actually cure it. You've got the Canadian beekeeper's blog. He's in a step where the, he feeds even in the snow. I don't try that. I'm, I'm just, I'm too conservative, I should say. I don't try pushing too much liquid into the hive. What we said earlier, too much condensation is what I think kills our bees. Your three-quarter inch board is only a .94 R value. If anybody's ever seen pictures of the FLIR cameras where they're looking at their hives, and you can just see this massive red glow where the, the brood chamber is. That means your heat's just escaping right on out of the box. I believe that bees not only heat the cluster, but they heat the air around them. The more space they have, so you've got two supers of honey on top, that heat escapes the cluster, it heats everything up above, it's just like your house. Furnace is in the basement, you're on the third floor, the third floor is going to be the hottest room in the house. So that's another reason I take them to a single box. They take off in the spring a lot faster. If they have less bees in the box, but it's easier to heat the brood, the queen can lay more brood, the cluster builds faster, you come from a five straight into an eight, if you use tens, you can jump from eight to in, but they build up faster. I, I just never really looked at that till I was talking to a gentleman and he actually brings his down to three frames, some in the winter, and then he brings them from three to five to six to eight to ten. And I'm sitting here going, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of equipment, that's a lot of work. But I do fives, threes, and eights. I don't know, do you guys do mediums or deeps? Both. Both. <clears throat> I think there's too much space for bees to cross in the winter time between each box if you're doing all mediums. I understand the weight. It's a lot lighter. I understand that, but what I said earlier, you get four or five days of it's just bitter cold and it doesn't get over 35. That cluster's static. It won't move left, right, up, or down. If it's against the top of that bar, it cannot cross that two and a quarter, three inch, however much it is, to get to that honey right above it. <clears throat> so that's where you see them froze to death and there's a super honey right above them. They, they just can't move. Anytime they're under 38 degrees is what they say is the ideal temperature to store bees. They can, they can barely move, but that's it. Get any colder and they're just stuck static in place. Uh, before the temperatures drop, you do all of this, you put your bees to bed, and I personally walk the bee yard every day. She gets on to me, she's like, God, you're going down there again? I walk the bee yard, I check the entrances on every hive, because if you don't, and you have a massive drop during a cold spell, they can block the entrance, they've got to have oxygen just like we do circulate through the hive that blocks that entrance, they can suffocate. I do not run top entrances during the winter. I do not ventilate them at all. To me, it's like leaving your third floor window open and you got your front door open. It comes straight through, through the brood and out the back. I learned that by watching an ob my observation hive. I have, it has two mason jar feeders with holes on top. I've got one with a mason jar feeder and the other one was just screen. It just kept smaller and getting smaller and smaller over the winter. And by the time spring got there, I had about a silver dollar size of bees and a queen. That happened two years in a row. I'm thinking, what's going on? And then I got to paying attention. Looked at them and I got to thinking, something's not right. Great queen, 
soon as spring gets there, I'd pull a frame of brood out of one of the other hives, put it in the top, and it she just explode. And then every two or three weeks, I'm taking frames of bees out of the observation hive. And I sit there and thought, and then I was putting, I put pollen up through the oven, trying to get them to lay, and the central unit kicked on. And it pulled air straight through the hole and straight out the top. I got a dust cloud in my face, and I'm sitting there going, the light came on. And that's what I was speaking about your hive in the top entrance. To me, you're just pulling that cold air right up through the brood chamber. They're having to work harder, in my opinion. There's some research out there that says that the condensation, or not this condensation, the humidity in the hive is actually detrimental to the mites. Now, where you treat, whether you don't treat, where you buy into that ladder, that, that's totally up to you. I do not use any harsh chemicals. I use essential oils and probiotics. I treat the symptoms, not the pest. I'm wanting the bees to start dealing with the pest. If I can get them to deal with the pest, they won't need me. Bees in the wild have dealt with this pest. At least some of them have. Some of them that make it through the winter don't make it through the next one. But do you really want bees that you have to treat like cattle? You have to immunize them, you have to feed them. That, that's all conjecture, but where'd my ag man go? Talking about feeding cattle, how much time is spent in, I, I don't know anything about cattle, how much time is spent in feeding cattle and that's taking the, care of that's them? That's the most time-consuming thing about raising cattle is winter and, feeding. And that's kind of the time-consuming thing about us, making sure they're medicated. I never, when I first started keeping bees, I sit there, I'm an analytical type person, and the club I'm in, they talk about, okay, the temperature is below 85. Everybody's got to treat your bees. And by the next meeting, everybody's hunting queens. I put one and two together, and came up with three. Okay, one you're treating, you're putting an insecticide in a hive to kill an insect living on an insect. Something just isn't right there. I'm not abdicating treatment free. Like I said, wherever you buy into that ladder, that, that's up to you. But there's got to be a better way. You know, if the commercial guys can get rid of just the treatments and the feeding, they've got massively clear profits. Do we have any treatment free? Pretty well. Pretty well? That's kind of the consensus. There's a small group of treatment free and then there's everybody else. Uh, do you have do you have solid bottom boards or screen? I have one screen bottom board and it's an eight frame and it's an emergency bottom board in case I run out of bottom boards. I, the thing with bottom boards is I never could get the queens to fully use that bottom box. And once summer solstice passed, that bottom box would be nothing but pollen. Well, if you're not using it to make queens or a breeding queen, you've got frames full of pollen that you have no use for. They're basically <clears throat> useless. You're going to sit there and pick out 6,000 cells of pollen, little side tip, fire ants. They're great for cleaning out pop frames of pollen. Uh, you just set, set a box down, put the frame in it, close it up, come back two days later, and they've cleaned it all out because they're protein eaters. Didn't know that, but I found that out this year. They're good at cleaning out slimed out uh, small high beetle frames too. Uh, put your mouse guards on because has anybody had that issue? A mummified mouse? Yep. I found one about the size of a half a baseball, and I kept figuring out what in the world that problem was doing there. Yep. I, I kept digging at it, digging at it, and then I seen a tail. <laughs> and I don't know how long he'd been there, but he was he was he was mummified. Yep. That that's another thing. You got to get mouse guards on there to protect your hives from any kind of intruder. Because if you think about it, they're in a cluster. It's cold. Anybody and their mother can walk in that front door. <coughs> Rats are opportunistic. They can go in there and they'll hang out, use the 
the heat from the hive live through the winter unless it gets warm enough and the bees figure it out. And like you said, they'll, they'll entomb them in propolis. Did you have any problems with the hive not using that hive they, body again? They don't like that mouse feed. Nope, they sure don't. And, they, and they chew all those frames up. They're, they're worse on frames than anything you have. Yeah, and you might as well just get rid of them. Uh, okay. When we went over, don't forget about your bees in the winter. Walk your bee yard and check to make sure that the hive entrance is open. Sunny days, 55 degrees or, or more. Check your sugar shim if you're going to use it. They call it the mountain camp because the guy's name is Camp. Came up with that idea. Uh, <coughs> dead outs. If you have a dead out and you notice it during the winter, I personally, I immediately open it up, find out what's wrong, what went wrong, clean it up, get those frames out because if you have a virus or a bacteria that killed that hive, you know what happens on a nice warm day in the winter time. Bees are looking for any and everything they can find. They'll go to your corn bins, they'll go to your, if you get, run a table saw, they'll go and get sawdust and take it back as protein. They're, they're foragers. They've got to have something to do. Clean it up. I leave the boxes open. If it's going to be four or five days of, of sunny days, I leave the boxes open, but I'll take the frames in. Clean them up, put them in the deep freeze for about a week, reuse them. Make sure I know exactly where they're going in the spring. I put them in there, make a split into it, and that split tanks, frames are gone. But one of the things I say a lot, and if people don't get it, is beekeepers look, but they don't see. We look at a frame, hey, got a frame of bees, there's brood, there's eggs, hey, I'm good, or there's the queen, put it back in the box. Did you look at your larva, did you notice that they were diseased? Did you see K-wings? Did you see deformed wings? Can queens have deformed wings syndrome? Yes, I finally ran into that. Opened the box, beautiful brood pattern, looked down in the box, and there's nothing but 22 shells sticking out from the frame. Found her, her wings were all shriveled up. Beautiful big queen. She was laying nothing but drones. Uh, I personally think, and there's a little bit of evidence out there that the sun does kill some of the viruses and bacteria. They say it doesn't live on your frames for more than seven to ten days. So, seven to ten days in the refrigerator, store them, that should get rid of it. Uh, American Fowl Bridge is another thing. We're not going to go down that road. Uh, that's basically all I've got. Is there any questions <coughs> or do you rotate your uh, brood boxes in the spring? If I leave two boxes on, no, because my honey supers are all mediums and my brood chambers well, are all deeps. Well, they're going to be in that top box. Well, I take them down to a single box. I might, right now I might have five out of a hundred and something hives that have two boxes on them. All the rest of them are down to a single box. Because that way, if the way I do it and put the sugar shim on top, they're always in contact with feed. Yeah. So if they're at the, even if they are at the top and it's so cold they can't go left or right, the bees at the top of the cluster are right against that sugar, yeah. so they can take it and pass it down. Because we all know <laughs> that the inside bees heat the cluster, the outside bees are the insulators, and it's kind of a, a rotating thing. They, the heaters rotate to the outside to be insulators, the ones that have fed go inside to be heaters. Okay. One single box you use, that's a deep that you keep? Yes, that's the deep. Whether it's a five frame, I've got a couple of two frame <coughs> mating newts that are still in the yard. I shoved them together today and put a little sugar shim on them and put an insulated lid on them. And they'll make it through winter in just two frames. So you have a deep and then the rest are mediums? <coughs> If I'm doing during the summer and spring and summer, yes, there'll be mediums on top. But if but if it's just going into winter, it's a bottom board, a D, the shim, and a lid. Okay, so you, they normally they 
have the root in the bottom mm -hmm. and other honey and whatever in the mediums, right? Yes, if I'm if so you're only spring, so. a deep, do you put some medium honey frames in the deep? No, that's all I run is deep. I do a few nukes for people that want mediums, very few. But I'll take and put all of the honey to the west side of the hive. Because your sun's going to be coming, arcing over, and mine are facing southeast. So it's going to be hitting the front side and the west side of the hive all day long. So it's going to heat that honey. So it's kind of like a top bar hive. If, when you put the top bar hive to bed, you put all the brood to one end and you put all the honey to the other. Because if you put the brood in the middle and honey on both ends, they may go left and run out and they can't go all the way back to the right. So the way I'm doing it is I'm forcing them to move to the west where the daily sun warms that, the honey up so they don't have to expend all that extra energy to warm it up. Honey is an insulator too. So by spring, all of my bees will be to the west side of the box. And as this gentleman's talking about rotating them, if you use two boxes, he's correct. The bees will be in that top box. You just you rotate it if you want, but in nature, the combs are four or five foot long in a tree. They'll start at the bottom. There's a great uh, YouTube video by Tom Seeley and Roger Patterson, uh, 2017, I think it is, the National Honey Show. They do a part one and part two on feral colonies. And they, as the winter starts coming, as they get preparing for winter, they'll start bringing that honey all the way down and they intersperse pockets of pollen in it. And as they go, and they'll start at the bottom, and as they go up through during the winter, they're hitting that pockets of pollen so they don't have to go searching for it to keep raising brood. That's how they do it in nature in our hives where we've got this removable frame. It's, it's 